Can everybody hear me? Does it need to go up a little? Better. <laughs> Just about it last time, too. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Joni Paddock, and I'm going to be your worship associate. I extend a warm welcome to those at home on Zoom. I have a couple of announcements this morning. I know we don't usually do um, announcements, but uh, we do have a couple of important ones. Uh, first of all, now is probably a good time to put your cell sound on your cell phones, please. We don't want anyone going off to any I also want to say, as if nobody in this room knows, happy Pride. Happy Pride 2021. Hey. And I, I would have been in the stage if you could say it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, also, next week is Socks on the Second. You may remember um, we had uh, a box in the brown box right where Jerry stands. Socks on the Second. If you can bring them to service, that's great next Sunday. And if you can't, if you can come during the week when the office is open, um, you can drop them in that brown box. It's pretty clearly marked Socks on the Second. You won't have them. Um, Many of you heard last month from Arlene Rosenthal, who's the president of Well in the Desert, and she talked about how incredibly appreciative the um, people that are affected by poverty are by the donations of socks. I guess, you know, last month they just went crazy. They had so many socks, and they were very, very grateful. So your help and your contributions would be gratefully accepted. The next is about our food donations. If you uh, saw in your newsletter, we're going to be doing uh, the donation box for the Families in the Migrant Education Program down in the East Valley. Sarita, Barb, Bill, and I are organizing a toy drive and also the food donation. So I want to show you something for the show and tell. Sarita and Barb went to, sorry, went to um, Lowe's and picked up this box. This is a perfect size box to make the donations. They're not too heavy when they're loaded. They fit nicely into the van that we're going to be having out in the parking lot on December the 3rd, which is a Friday afternoon. And if I remember right, it's 3 to 6, but look in your newsletter, because or yeah, the newsletter, and it'll say the hours. We'll have it right out front here so you can't miss it. So this is here taped to this box, the sample box, and it lists all the food items that they have requested at the Migrant Education Program. If you don't have the list, if you just want to have an extra copy or whatever, see Sarita. I think everybody knows Sarita. Um, after service, and she has some printed out. So that uh, it'll make it so much easier. The box is a dollar ten at Lowe's, so if you can go to Lowe's and it's small, small size, and it, like I say, it just makes it. Last year there was some that were just so heavy it was really difficult to lift them into the van and out of the van and transport them into the building once we got there. That would be really helpful. Okay, drum roll maestro. We have the results of the auction, the silent auction and the live auction held on Zoom last night. And the total is, I'm getting choked up, I'm so excited, $20,000 even. A huge thank you to everyone who bid and everyone who donated, and to Carol Lavoy, oh my God, yeoman's work. She was amazing. She still is. <laughs> She's tabulating everything as we speak, and you should have an email no later than Tuesday with uh, what you might have won in the auction and uh, what you might have donated and who won your item. So keep a lookout for something from Carol. I just want to also recognize Peter Matthews, who was... MC extraordinaire. He was wonderful last night. Um, he was he was fun and funny and kept right up with it. And I think we were done before 7:30, right? It was like 7:20. I think we were all done. So, uh, for those of you who missed it, you really missed a fun time. I got to tell you, last year when she was said it was going to be on Zoom, I was a real skeptic. But it was a lot of fun last year, and it was just as much fun this year. We're hoping to have it live here next year. <laughs> Please God. I also want to recognize Jack Fitzsimmons who did. All the graphics, for any of you that saw on Zoom last night or might have gotten a booklet, um, he did all the graphics and he did a wonderful job. He does so much. All the graphics that you see here are done by Jack, so I just wanted to give him a shout out. So. I think that's it for announcements. I don't think I missed anything. 
Now I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the historic lands of the various bands of Kauia people. We honor the unique relationship that we hope emerges between our community and the indigenous people and their ter traditional territory. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the Kauia people whose lands and water we benefit from today. I would also like to point out that November is Native American Heritage Month, which is a federally recognized event in which celebrates the rich and diverse cultures and traditions of our Native people. In years past, Bill and I have attended some of the powwows that have been held locally here in the Valley, but unfortunately, due to COVID, their, their uh, festivals are virtual. Uh, you might find it interesting to look online. There's more information about the culture and traditions of our local indigenous people. Uh, let's see. Oh, pride. I did want to mention one other thing about pride. We had a record number of people sign up to march. We had 16 marchers this morning marching in the pride parade, all wearing the bright yellow standing on the side of love t-shirts that many of you have probably seen over the years. And we also have a banner that was handmade by one of our members, Juanita Garner, from several years ago. Her son actually made the banner. It's a big, bright, yellow and it says, you know, UCOD standing on the side of love, brightly painted with rainbow colors and it's just beautiful. So we've become known here in the Pride Parade and other places as the yellow people. Group. <laughs> so in that spirit, I also want to say that uh, here at UUCOD, it doesn't matter where, pardon me, where you or your ancestors have come, who you love, your gender identity, your theology, your politics, or your immigration status, we welcome all who are committed to our core values as expressed in our seven principles, and those can be found on the back of your order of worship if anyone's not familiar with them. Together we come to this place to share our hopes, dreams, and visions. We seek to build a diverse and inclusive community that honors our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every being. Thanks for being with us this morning, both here in the sanctuary and virtually at home. And finally, please consider making a donation today to support the many programs we offer and all the good work that we do in the area, particularly of social justice. If you're here in the sanctuary, you can leave your offering in one of the two baskets. One's located by that door over there, and one is located if you exit by this door here, you can drop it in that basket right there. And for those that are watching virtually, please do donate using the virtual offering basket, which there was a link in the email you received this morning. Or if you didn't get that link, or you just want to send an old-fashioned check, that's fine too. Just be sure to send it to our PO box, not to the physical address. And if you want to be on our email list to learn more about us and our programming, please contact us at admin at uucod.org. And now we will bring the Tibetan bowl, and that, the music of the centering will follow. Thank you. 
Good morning and welcome again. I am the Reverend Ian Riddell and I have the honor of serving this congregation as its minister. We gather together as a congregation and a tradition that celebrates the richness and beauty of individual lives and understands that the tapestry we weave together is made stronger and more vibrant by our collaboration and by the sharing of our lives and our visions for a community of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And so I say to all of you, come one, come all. Come with your missing pieces and your extra screws. Come with your hard edges and your soft spots. Come with your bowed heads and your upright spines. Come all you flamboyant and drab, verbose and quiet fidgeting and lethargic, all you with large vision and tender hearts, all you with small courage and tender fears, bring your lisp and your stutter and your song, bring your gravel and your drawl and your lilt, bring your anger and your joy and your righteous indignation, misfits and conformists and everyone in between. Come into this space and be welcome. Bring who you are. Bring where you've traveled. Bring where you long for. And let us worship together. And now please join me in our unison aspiration as Reverend Ian lights our chalice. May love be the spirit of this church. May the quest for truth be its sacrament, its service be its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, and to help one another in fellowship. This is our aspiration. We invite Charissa and Barb to come forward to light our We light this candle in solidarity with black, indigenous, and other people of color as they journey towards spiritual wholeness. May we, as a beloved community, work to dismantle racism and all forms of oppression. May we live out our principles so that justice, dignity, and equity for all prevail. These are the joys and sorrows of our community on this November day. We share special prayers for Sarita's brother David Steigler. 
We light a candle returning to spirit. Joan Elliott, brother Malcolm, has unexpectedly ended her theme song with identical twin Melvin, twin Melvin and sister Joan. May the Elliott families be held within the beloved. Cheryl lights two candles today. First, a candle of sorrow for Portland friends Tracy and Randy, suffering from their family tragedy and a loss as a result of domestic violence. A second candle for her neighbor Bruce Montgomery, who is in the care of the We light a candle today for the people who lost their lives in the 15th and 20th of Oakland over the crowded. And we light a candle of hope for our UUCOD friend Corbett Bratt as he recovers from surgery, which will hopefully remove all his health. The surgery was a success, but he's still dealing with some residual issues and remains hopeful that he'll be home early this week. Please keep him in your healing thoughts and send lots of positive energy into the universe. And we share a candle for all those joys and sorrows that remain in the silence of our hearts this morning, unspoken, but still real and powerful in our lives. We pause, gathered together in community, both here and virtually, we gathered together in community, a community of love, a community of hope, a community of trust, a community of gathered in that we hold in our hearts all those who are suffering despair, violence, fear. And we hold in our hearts today all those who are celebrating the joy of the festival. Celebration live together in our hearts. So we need community. We need a reminder that we are not We are gathered even when we are spread apart in the arms of love. In the arms of a love that is broader and deeper, more powerful than we can see. We are part of it as it lives in us. So we pause now in a moment of quiet reflection as we rest in our hearts, our bodies, and our minds and our spirits in this community. Voices are really loud. And then I'm like, oh, they're talking about me. So I would like to move back a little bit and invite Joni to do our reading for the day, followed by our hymn. Thank you. The reading this morning that is being heard. To invoke love is to ask for a hug from a thunderstorm, to feel tea in the lap of the infinite pitcher, to make the biggest, most embarrassing mistake of your life in front of everyone who matters. To invoke love is to never know if it will come softly with the nuzzle of a beloved dog, or pounce right on your chest, chest with the strength of a lioness 
protecting her cubs, her pride, her home life. To invoke love is to take the risk of inviting chaos to visit the places you spent so much time making tidy and watch as the breath of life scatters everything you had only folded and tossed to the way. To invoke love is to allow for the possibility that your words and actions might become so empowered you can no longer believe in apathy but a self-righteous idea idea a self-righteous idea to invoke love is to give up self-deprecation false humility pride to consider yourself worthy to be made whole willing to encounter love that will never let us let each other go to invoke love is to guard against assumptions, to take care with our words and practice forgiveness, not as a serial ideal, ideal, but right here in the messy midst of our imperfect lives. To invoke love is to approach each day and every person with wonder, anticipating love's arrival. Is this the moment? Is this love's grand entrance? Is this person the embodiment of love? Am I good enough? To invoke love is to play the fool, the one more concerned with loving than with the appearance or reputation, the one ready and willing to be vulnerable, abandoning anything that gets in love's way. To invoke love is to be ready to become here, now, in everything we do. Are you ready?
before I begin, I want to take a moment to say thank you again to our AV folks um, and to our ushers and greeters who have really over the past couple of months as we've come back together um, been so wonderful at welcoming people here while also striving to maintain the policies that we have set, which have changed over time. They have done work which has changed every week. So I want to say thank you to our ushers and our greeters for uh, this morning. Uh, if you uh, didn't see in our newsletter, we have changed our protocols a little bit now. Now that we are requiring proof of vaccination for everybody, we have lifted the restrictions to members and families. And so now we are at a place where if people wish to come and worship with us as long as they can provide proof of vaccination and will remain masked and continue all our other protocols, uh, that we are welcoming again. So thank you to our ushers especially for uh, managing and living through these changes as they happen. I also want to remind you of one of our other requests as you come to uh, worship with us in person. If you have been traveling or if you've been in an environment with a large group of people and you're not sure about everyone's vaccination status, we really do ask, or if you're feeling ill, we really do ask that you either choose to stay away for a little while just to make sure that things are safe or get a COVID uh, test so that we continue to be as safe as we can. I traveled out of the country last week, and I want to let you know I got a COVID test on my return, and so um, I hope that uh, we can all keep these things in mind as we strive to balance the values of openness and welcome and the safety of our community. So thank you, all of you, for being so wonderful and good with each other. So good morning, I'll say again, and happy Pride. It's good to see you all, and I know we have some lower numbers today because many of our congregation are, as Joni said, gathered in downtown Palm Springs for the annual Pride Parade. And this year, Pride has made me think back over my own history and experiences with Pride Parades, and I imagine, or Pride Festivals, or just Pride in general, I imagine you have your memories too. I remember Toronto in 1992, watching the parade in front of the movie theater where I was working for the summer and shocking my coworkers as I came out to them and then joined the other thousands of people in the parade down Young Street that day. I'll always remember those faces. <laughs> I remember Victoria, British Columbia in 1994 marching almost at the front of the parade. The dykes on bikes were always at the front of the parade. Always. Marching, though, right behind them with my choir of lesbians, gay men, and allies and singing songs of affirmation and resistance. I remember Madison, Wisconsin in 2007, riding a trolley with another choir, uh, the gay men's chorus that I conducted, and responding to hate-filled religious protesters by singing Jesus Loves Me in four-part heart. They, I remember those faces, too. <laughs> I remember Las Vegas in 2014, wandering around the downtown of Las Vegas in a clergy collar, looking for my congregants who were gathering to march, and being questioned by a passerby as to whether I was there in support or in protest. I said, I'm marching. And they said, amen. And I remember San Diego in 2017, at the front of the parade again, actually, at this time, but this time with 50 or more clergy colleagues in robes and collars and stoles and yarmulkes, letting thousands of people know that there were religious communities that supported, honored, and celebrated them. I imagine that many of you have memories of pride past. It is so often a celebration of great joy and community, reveling and dancing and singing and wearing fabulous outfits we wish we could wear all. And as every year go by, we celebrate more and more the changes in our world that our hard work and commitment and perseverance has brought to us, the changes that we have demanded for our LGBTQ lives and families, decriminalization, legal protections, adoption rights, health care, marriage equality. So many gains to celebrate, so much love and perseverance to honor. I know that I wake every day grateful for the commitment and hard work and sacrifice 
of those who have come before me. People who gave their time, their skill, their stubbornness, sometimes their livelihoods or their lives to build a new world for all of us. So we celebrate and share gratitude every day, but especially at Pride. I remember, though, one of my friends asking me once, why pride? Isn't pride a sin? So what is pride? Why do we use that word? We, we talk about pride coming before a fall. We wonder about those times when we or others proclaim our own superiority, our disdain for those not as successful or beautiful or well off as we are. Pride. But I see another face to pride. In a world that so often tells so many of us that we are unworthy of love, that we are not deserving of the protection of the law, that the way we live our lives is sinful, that we may not actually deserve to exist. In that world, a world that has examples like this, I'm going to share one though you know I could go on and on about the ways in which this world treats so many of us. Last month, a state legislator in Texas, in his capacity as chair of the Housing House Committee on General Investigating in Texas, notified the department in charge of education in Texas that he was instigating an investigation of school districts and the type of books that were in schools and where they were kept and how much money they spent. The list of books was 16 pages long, contained more than 850 book titles. Many of these books dealt with race, the lives of non-white people in our country, and our nation's history of racism and oppression, and resistance to that racism and oppression. It feels like this is part of the ongoing challenge to teaching the real history of our nation and its people a challenge hiding behind critique of critical race theory, which no one who's critiquing it can describe, apparently. It's part of the attempt to whitewash our history and keep our young citizens from learning the true story of our country, disasters, pain, and heroic resistance to oppression, all being swept under the carpet. Now, the list of books isn't limited to racial issues. The Texas Tribune reported that other listed books that this legislator wants school districts to account for are about teen pregnancy, abortion, and homosexuality, including LGBT families, or a book called The Letter Q, Queer Writer's Notes to Their Younger Selves, or The Underground Guide to Teenage Sexuality, biographies of Harvey Milk and others, and the children's book, And Tango Makes Free. It's not clear what the outcome of this investigation may be, but it is clear that this legislator, running for state attorney general in Texas, by the way, knows he can make political points and gain wide support by implying that books that share the realities and possibilities of life for non-white, non-cisgendered, non-straight people should be removed from schools. The children should not be exposed to the realities and possibilities of life, nor should they ever be made to feel uncomfortable. This is the world, which is unfortunately still the world so many of us and our neighbors and kin live in. In that world, pride can be a very different thing. What if we were to imagine pride as love for self in the face of shame? Or hope for the future in the face of those striving to erase? What if pride is working for justice in the face of the evil of prejudice? What if pride is embracing each other in the face of the denial of our deep love and connections? What if pride is celebrating our glorious variety in the face of deadening demands for normal? What if pride is gratitude and honor for the achievements of the past and a commitment to work for a love-affirming future for all of us. What if that's what we mean by pride? And so we express that pride. Today we celebrate 
We embrace each other. We express gratitude for the sacrifices and constructive work of those who came before us. Now, I call today's service Our Pride Should Be a Promise because the actions of Texas legislators and politicians and religious leaders and so many others around our country tell us that they are also aware of the way the world is changing or that they fear it could change. And they are fighting back. They are asserting the status quo. They are passing legislation and regulations to limit the possibilities of life for our trans neighbors and kin. They are working to erode the rights we have fought so hard for. They are working hard for our erasure and are tacitly and sometimes explicitly condoning violence and exclusion. Our pride is a statement. As we said back in the 90s, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. It says that we are all, all of us, worthy of love and dignity and that our existence is a blessing on the world. It says we love ourselves and our kin. But we here in this room, in this gathering, know that love is not just a passive emotion. It is action. It is a choice. It is a commitment, a promise to the thriving and growth of our neighbors and kin, all of them, all of us. Our pride is a call to act in the world to make change, to answer the call of love, to let love guide our actions in the world. And so we mark. We campaign. We support justice with our voice, votes and our voices and our wallets. We resist the erasure of whole peoples through political action, through protest, through letter writing, through talking with our neighbors and kin, to having those hard conversations. And the evil of all of this is not just out there, friends. We know that. So we commit to changing our own hearts our own ways of being. Seeing clearly our own prejudices, our own discomfort, our own confusion. Seeing these clearly with honesty and com compassion and committing to being better. Essayist Leslie Jameson writes, empathy isn't just something that happens to us, it's a choice we make to pay attention, to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, that dowdier cousin of impulse. The act of choosing simply means we've committed ourselves to a set of behaviors greater than the sum of our individual inclinations. She continues, I believe in intention and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for our better selves. We are called to affirm the understanding that each individual human being is born with worth and dignity inherent in their very being, not because of or despite the randomness and richness of where they are born or what their family looks like or the shade of their skin or the religion they choose or which chooses them or the work they do in the world or how they live in their bodies or who they have no choice but to love. No, inherent and inborn worth and dignity. And we are also called to recognize that we are inextricably linked to of all of their life, woven into a vast tapestry of, of existence of which we are a powerful, integral, and holy part. We are deeply connected with each other. Our lives are deeply interwoven with the lives of all of the other creatures on this planet. Sister Simone Campbell, one of the nuns on the bus, if you remember those folks, said that we may have different stories to tell, but it's the same hunger, the same desire, the same passion to make a difference in our world, to care for family, to be who we are called to be. And so we choose, we can choose, to respond to each person we meet with curiosity, with empathy, and compassion, not because they are needy, 
or in danger or odd, but just because they are. We must choose empathy and curiosity and openness. I tell the story I'm about to tell you a lot. You may have heard it from me before. It keeps coming up over and over as a story that points to a central way to be in the world that I think helps us build a community where all are worthy, loved, and celebrated. Where we understand that difference and diversity, even strangeness and oddity and quirk, can make us a strong, rich, vibrant community. Where curiosity and empathy are central virtues in our relationships and our culture. Where we build space and support for each of us answering the call of our life. The invoking of love and sharing that with neighbors. And it's, it's an old, old story. I have heard it told that there was once a rabbi, a great and beloved teacher. Students came from far and wide to learn and grow with this wise and compassionate elder. And one day, the rabbi gathered their students around and, as the rabbi often did, asked them a question, a very important question in Jewish ritual and tradition. How can you tell if it's day or night? How can you tell if the dawn has come? And the most eager student spoke up and said, Is it when you see a tree in the distance and you can tell whether it's a date tree or a fig tree? No, said the rabbi. And the most earnest student spoke and said, Is it when you can see an animal in the distance and tell whether it's a dog or a goat? No, said the rabbi again. Increasingly frustrated, the most impatient and impertinent student spoke and said, well, how can you tell then? The rabbi responded, it is when you look into the face of the person in front of you, whoever they may be, wherever they are from, whatever they're standing in life, whatever the color of their skin, whatever clothing they wear, whatever language they speak, when you can look into the face of the person in front of you, and know that they are your kin. If you cannot see that, the rabbi concluded, it is still night. Our hearts are broken by stories of repression and violence, by the diminishing of spirit and the withholding of love. May we remember that through the cracks of our broken hearts, can grow kindness and tenderness, mercy and hope. May our broken hearts be the ground of our steadfast faithfulness to all of our kin in this life, whoever they may be, wherever they are from, whatever they are standing in life, whatever the color of their skin, whatever clothing they wear, whatever language they speak, that each holy life may flourish and shine and bless the world in dignity with their joy and passion and rich beauty. May we know as we share together in our grief and in our prideful celebration that we are inextricably woven together into the vast song of the cosmos, woven into a common life and a common destiny. May we rejoice in the beauty and strength of the music we weave with our lives. May we cherish each life as a holy gift of love to the world. And may our pride our love for our holy self, our rejection of shame and oppression. May our pride invite and lure and challenge and guide us to choosing to act for the protection of all of those around us, to act for the support of all of our kin, especially those who society says shouldn't exist, to act to celebrate each and every day the wondrous beauty and majesty and sheer gloriousness of all the ways we live in our bodies and share our love with the world. Let's invoke that love and let it be the love that guides us every day ahead. May it be so. Answering the call of love is our closing hymn.
And now please join me as we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. As we end our time together this morning, may we carry the flame of our community in our hearts, light that we may truly see the beauty of our neighbors, warmth that we may greet all we meet with acceptance and kindness, and fire to fuel our passion for a world transformed by love. Go in peace, my friends, love and serve the world.